Chapter 10. The Bean Trees. Even a spotted pig looks black at night. This is another thing Mom used to tell me quite often. It means that things always look different and usually better in the morning. And they did. Maddie called first thing to say that Esperanza was going to be alright. Dan pumped her stomach after all because she hadn't taken enough to do much harm. I made Estevan a big breakfast. Eggs, scrambled tomatoes and peppers and green chili sauce. And sent him home before I could even start falling in love with him again over the breakfast dishes. Turtle woke up in one of those sweet eye rubbing moods that kids must know by instinct as a means of saving the human species from extinction. Luann came home from the Reese family reunion singing La Bamba. It's surprising considering Roosevelt Park, but we always heard birds in the air. There must be transients in the bird world too. Rumpled feathered outcasts that naturally seek out each other's company in inferior and dying trees. <coughs> Excuse me. In any case, there were lots of them. There was a type of woodpecker that said, Ha ha ha, to heck with you. I swear it did. Another one, a little pigeony looking bird, said, Hip hip haroo. Luann insisted that they were saying, Who cooks for who? She said she had read it in a magazine. I had a hard time imagining what kind of magazine would go into something like that, but I wasn't about to argue. It was the first time I could remember hanging on to her own opinion about something. Luann not normally being inclined in that direction. One time in a restaurant she once told me a waiter mistakenly brought her somebody else's dinner, and she just ate it, rather than make trouble. It was bi beef shingles on toast. Gradually, Luann and I were changing the house around, filling in empty spaces left behind by Aunt Hale with ABC books and high chairs and diaper totes and all manners of toys, all larger than a golf ball. I had bought Turtle a real bad junior size, from new to you. We turned the screen porch in the back into a playroom for the kids. Not that Dwayne Ray did any serious playing yet, but he liked to sit out there strapped in his car seat watching Turtle plant her cars into the flower pots. The fire engine she called Domato, whereas the orange car was Carrot, or sometimes she called it Tutu, which is what I had named my Volkswagen, after that man who profited from my rocker arm disaster. I had considered putting Turtle's bed out there on the porch too, but Luann said it wouldn't be safe. That someone might come along and slash the screen and kidnap her before you could say Jack Robinson. I would never have thought of that. But it didn't matter. The house was old and roomy. There was plenty of space for Turtle's bed in my room. It was a type of house they called a rambling bungalow. The term reminded me of somehow of Elvis Presley movies. With rain scotting and steam radiators and about 50 coats of paint on the door frames so that you could use your thumbnail to scrape out a history of all the house's tenants as far back as the 60s, when people were fond of painting their woodwork apple green and royal blue. The ceilings were so high you'd just learn to live with the cobwebs. It wasn't unreasonably hot yet, and the kids were bouncing around the house like Super Bowls. Balls. This is mainly Turtle with Dwayne Ray's participation being mainly vocal. So we took them out to sit under the arbor for a while. <coughs> the wisteria vines were a week or two past full bloom, but the bees and the perfume still hung thick in the air overhead, giving it a sweet purplish blue hue. If you ignore the rest of the park, you could imagine this as a special little heaven for people who had lived their whole lives without fear of bees. Luann was full of gossip from her weekend with the Ruiz cousins. Apparently most of them spoke English, all the men were good looking and loved to dance, and all the women had children Dwayne Ray's age. She had about decided that every single one of them was nicer than on Hell, a conclusion to which they all hardly agreed, even on Hell's mother. A large portion of the flock were preparing to move to San Diego. I can't believe it, she said. First Manny and Ramona, you remember? The friends I told you about that saw the meteor shower? And now the two uh, on Hell's brothers and their wives and kids. You think they discovered gold out there? On Hell used to always talk about moving to California too. But I tell you this right now, 
Mama would have had an, a, an epileptic. She thinks in California they sell marijuana in the produce section of the grocery store. Maybe they do. Maybe that's why everybody wants to live there. Not me, Luann said. Not for a million. And I'll tell you why, too. In about another year, they were due to have the biggest earthquake in history. I read about it someplace. They say all of San Diego might just end up in the ocean, like noodle soup. I guess the sharks will be happy, they said. Taylor, I swear. These are my relatives you're talking about. On hell's relatives, they said. You're practically divorced. Not to hear them tell it, Luann said. Turtle was staring up at the wisteria flowers. Beans. She said, pointing. Bees, I said. Those things that go bzzz are bees. They sting, Luann pointed out. But Turtle shook her head. Bean trees, she said, as plainly as if she had been thinking about it all day. We looked where she was pointing. Some of the wisteria flowers had gone to seed. And all these wonderful long green pods hung down from the branches. They looked as much like beans as anything you ever could ever eat. Well, will you look at that, I said. There's another miracle. The flower trees were turning into bean trees. On the way home, Luann went to the corner to buy a newspaper. She was seriously job hunting now and had applied to a couple of nursery schools. Though I could just hear a Luann would ask for a job. Really, ma'am, I could understand why you wouldn't want to hire a dumb old thing such as myself. Turtle and I walked the other way since we needed to stop in at the leasing market for eggs and milk. Lorraine refused to set foot in there these days, saying that leasing always gave her the evil eye. Lorraine's theory was that she was mad at her for having had Dwayne Ray instead of a girl, going against some supposedly foolproof Chinese method of prediction. My theory is that Lorraine suffered from the same disease as snow boots, feeling guilty for things beyond your wildest imagination. In any case, today leasing was nowhere to be seen. She often went back to check on her famous century-old mother, the source of Maddie's purple beans, whom neither Luann nor I had ever laid eyes on, though not of lack of curios for lack of curiosity. According to Maddie, no one had sighted her for years, but always had the feeling she was back there. Lee Singh had uh, left her usual sign by the cash register. Be back one minute. Please do not steal anything. Lee Singh. I spotted Edna in paper goods the next dial over from the dairy case. As best as I could see, Edna was sniffing different brands of toilet paper. Edna, Miss Poppy, I called out. When I needed to call her by name, I generally hedged my bets and used both first and last. He... Her head popped up and said, and seemed, and she seemed confused, looking all around. It's me, Taylor, over here. I came around into the aisle where they had parked their cart. Or cart. Where's Miss Parsons today? I stopped dead in my tracks. I know how to white cane. Virgie is ill in bed with the croup. I'm sorry to say. She sent at me out to get fresh lemons and drop of whiskey. And of course, a few other unmentionables. She smiled, dropping a package of orange toilet paper into the cart. Can you tell me, dear, if these are lemons or limes I have? She ran her head over good, her goods and held up a lopsided ba uh, pl uh, plastic bag of yellow flu fruit. And a poppy was blind. I stood for a minute, staring, trying to reckon, reorganize things in my mind, the way you would rearrange a room full of furniture. Edna buying all her clothes in one color, ever since age 16. Virgie's grip on her elbow. I remember the fantasy I constructed the day of our dinner party. Edna happily discovering red bobby pins in the drugstore. I had, to com I had it completely wrong. It would have been Virgie May who found them. Plucked them down off the rack of the Oreo cookies, burrettes, and purchased them for a friend. Are you with me, dear? I'm sorry, I said lemons. They're kind of small, but they look just fine. When I get when I got home, I asked Lion if she knew. She insisted I was making up the whole thing. Is it a joke, she kept asking. Because if it is, it's a sick one. It's not a joke. She had a white cane. She asked me if she had was lemons or lines. Think about it. The way she looks over your head when she talks. The way Virgie leads her around. How Virgie always says everybody's name when the two of them come into the room. Lorraine is horrified. 
Oh my god, she said. Oh my merciful heavens, I feel about this big. Whenever I think about... Whenever I think about all the times I just bounced over there and said, See you this, see you that. Thanks for keeping an eye on Dwayne Ray. I don't think she minds. Her eyes are her hands and Virgie. And she has her own special ways of keeping an eye on things. I told Luann, and this seemed to make her feel better. On Monday afternoon, I asked if it would be okay if I went up to, to see Esperanza. I had never been upstairs at Maddie's for some reason. And for some reason, it felt like it was off limits. But she said fine to, to go on up. I went through the cramped study, which of course was still piled high with Maddie's dead husband's magazines. I knew by now that he had been dead for many years, so it seemed unlikely that his mess would clear up anytime soon. And on up on the staircase into Maddie's living room. It had the same crowded, uh, higgly piggly look as the office downstairs. Though the, junk, though the stuff here had more to do with everybody, with everyday living. Junk mail, bills, pencils, magazines with colored pictures of people like Tom Selleck and the President, not Jesus. A folded newspaper with a half-worked cross puzzle. The occasional pliers or screwdriver. It was a type of flossum and jetsam, a pair of words I had just learned from the dictionary. That washes up on your coffee table, lies around for a week or so, and then makes way for whatever comes in on the next side. Every surface was covered. Tables, chairs, walls. Over the fireplace, there was a big cross made up of hundreds of small, brightly glazed pieces of tile, which one, each one shaped like something. A boy, a dog, a house, a palm tree, a bright blue fish. Today, they all added up to a cross. I had never seen anything like it. Though a wall across from the fireplace was covered with pictures of every imaginable size and shape. There were snapshots of people squinting into the sun. A few studio portraits of children. Pictures of Maddie flanked by other people. All of them dark and shorter than herself. There were a number of children drawings. I remember Maddie telling me when we first met that she had something like grandchildren around here. How they, that had struck me as such a peculiar thing to say. I noticed that practically all the kids' drawings had guns in them somewhere, and huge bullets suspended in the air, hanging on the dotted lines that flowed like waterfalls out of the gun's barrel. There were many men in turtle-shaped army helmets. One picture showed a helicopter streaming blood. The living room had no windows, just doors opening off in four directions. An older woman came in with a cardboard box and looked at me with surprise, asking something in Spanish. I had never before seen anyone whose entire body looked sad. Her skin just seemed to hang from her, especially from her arms, above the elbows and her jaw. Esperanza, I said, and she nodded toward the door at the back. The room seemed to be long in another house. It was empty. The walls were an antique-looking uh, shade of light pink, completely bare except for a cross, which... Uh, two palm fr fronds struck behind it, over one of them, uh, over one of the beds. The two beds were neatly made up with rough-looking blue blankets that surely were that uh, no one would sleep under this winter. Esperanza was not in either bed, but sitting up in a straight-back chair by the window. She looked up and I knocked on the door casement. Hi, I came to see what you're doing. She got it from the chair and offered it to me. She sat on the bed. I don't believe she had been doing anything at all, just sitting with her hands in her lap. We looked at each other for a second, then looked at a few other things in the room, of which there were painfully few. I didn't know what I thought I'd have the nerve to do this. How are you feeling now? Are you feeling better? Your stomach's okay? I put my hand on my stomach. Esperanza nodded. Then looked at her hands.